Alright. Yeah, hello. Alright, are we good? Alright, cool. Hello, I'm Aaron Thomas and this is Lessons Learned from Poning My University. So a little about me. I'm an undergraduate student at Penn State Berks. I have a major in SRA that I'm working on right now and I'm usually pretty good at public speaking. And so this is going to focus on two little bits of ponage that I had. It is incident 417061, that I'm just going to call incident whatever, because I don't like remembering all those numbers, which is me finding a really silly shell injection vulnerability that really should never exist, and how a silly idea I had with QR codes made me start so, All right, how a crazy idea involving some QR codes turned me into a bit of a security researcher in the making. So I'm going to go over... What is poning? Because there is some disagreement. Some of you might not know. It's from Warcraft originally, not chess. People saying it's from chess are trolling, or they were trolled. And it, in this context, we're going to call it just doing something despite the fact that there are security controls in place to stop you from doing that. So let's talk about incident. It's basically a combination of two things that can cause a lot of fun. A bored college student and some old, ugly web apps. It all began when my friend Jake said, hey, check this out. And he said, check to that out. All right, now I'm going to try to, can I show Firefox? I want to like show the web app. All right. Wait, OK. Here we are in Pass Explorer. So right here. It's a bit cut off, that's unfortunate, but we see we see basically an ugly web app, right? Whereas here's the mouse. And I can like click the I can click this, I can just view a folder like past users, which is just a lot of stuff. It's ugly. I poked around here a while because he was like, hey, this is how the university wants users to get their files when they're not here. But I didn't get much. I found this button, which is permission. So first I have to select a directory. It doesn't really matter which for these purposes. And from here, oh, hit the wrong button because it's off screen. We hit permissions. Perfect. It brings up this little wizard where we can go next. And there's the give read permissions, give read write, give full control. And none of those were very interesting to me because I couldn't do that because I didn't have the permissions. But I could view them. And that was a lot of fun because I could see different users that could do stuff, different groups. And this all really leads to the groups page where there's a lot of weird groups where these are groups I've created and it creates an admin and owner group as well. And then this special link, you can create a new group. This page is where all the magic of incident whatever happened. And wait for it to load. So we can create a group type of personal. And normally it doesn't allow us to have lowercase text, numerals, periods, dashes, underscores. If I do group, I'm going to just do Aaron's group with an apostrophe S space group for a demonstration because that's clearly not valid. So it'll say, hey, you can't have that as your group name. If I click Create Group, it'll just say this. But using a magical tool that only Leet hackers know about called Inspect Element, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's true, in this folder. Yeah, this field right here, there's this class, Required Validate. I do that, and it'll send a post request and actually try to do it. And a long time ago, it wouldn't have said UMG name is not acceptable. It would have said something different. And we're going to see what it said. If I can go back to my slides. So yeah, just now it validated my input. But that was not always the case because incident whatever has been reported and fixed. Bad input. When I gave it Aaron's group, it would tell me this. Make group.sh error. You gave this file two arguments, or you should run this with two arguments. You gave three. I thought that was pretty weird. 
So what's happening? I just gave it the seemingly not that bad group, Aaron's group, and there was a shell script that wanted two of our items, so it got three. That means user input is being passed directly to the shell. <laughs> so we're going to own the shell. We're going to pwn the shell. So one of the two things is happening. It's either doing sh make group sh input from the form and then something, or it's doing something and then input. So what we need to do is we need to satisfy group sh and then handle the something at the end if that is the case. So let's just give it the input x semicolon ls. If we have something at the beginning, it should just make a group for x or whatever and then show us the current directory. It should work. It didn't work. But that means it's the other way around because it said you only gave one argument. So I know, oh, hey, I'm supposed to give it two arguments at the beginning separated by spaces, a semicolon, and then my commands. And then I can just comment out the other thing. So what I did is I could do sh make group. Oh, wait. The way it works is sh make group dot sh, the input I give, and then something at this point we know. So we're going to satisfy make group, and we're going to handle the something. So we're just going to echo whatever is at the end, because I'm a little curious. I want to know what it is. I'm poking around and having fun. So x space x ls echo. The file's in the working directory, and then it was my Penn State username. So it turns out the way make group sh worked is it just said the first part is the input. That's the name of the group. The second part is who the group is going to be created for and who's going to be in the group. And then it was done. But so the files I saw that I thought were cool were makegroup.sh, because that's the one that was doing stuff and I was interacting with a little bit. And there was one called badwords.txt. At this point, I'm excited because I'm in. I made it. By the way, the file extension is called JIF, J-Y-F-E. That's how you pronounce it, spelled G-I-F. It's called JIF. It's not GIF or JIF. And so some lessons learned at this point is that these silly vulnerabilities are out there. And if you're a web admin, you might want to make sure they're not there. And if you want to find them, you're going to have to look where most people never will. I think it's safe to say less than 10 people had actually used that create group page in the past few years. I might have been the only person to view it. So future injections. We know what that something at the end is, and it doesn't really matter. We just want it gone. So we can just comment it out with a pound sign. So I want to I wanna see what's in badwords.txt, just for curiosity's sake. And there is some weird stuff in there that wasn't that bad that I'm going to show off. So there was carpet muncher, if you want to insult most people, I guess. At least 50% of people, probably. Molesta priest, which is, I mean, OK. I can see how that would be offensive, but it's so badly done that it's more funny than offensive. And this one I really enjoyed was just root with zeros instead of O's. And apparently that's bad. But I actually can create groups with those in them. That's just what you can't name the entire group itself. It was really funky. So I want to just look at the contents of make group. So I'm going to do x space x cat make group and then comment out everything at the end. And so this gave me the entire script on a single line. There were no line breaks. There's no semicolons between the individual lines. But it did say in one of the lines, echo, you should run this file with two arguments. You gave it this many. And I just want to say to whoever made that script, thank you. I had nice animated, yeah, thank you appeared, right? Cool. So lessons learned. Helpful error messages can hurt a lot as well if they're too helpful and they're displayed to the wrong people. And so you want to be, be careful and cover your butt. That applies to everyone in this context as well, because at this point I was on my laptop, connected to university Wi-Fi, logged, isn't, logged in as myself, logged into the web app as myself, so I thought, you know what, if I don't report this and they find it someday and realize I saw like a bad words file, I might actually get in trouble. So let's report this bad boy. So I go to the IT help desk in the library, because that's the first place I can think of. They say, hey, talk to the head of IT. He just left. So I'm like, all right, I'll come back tomorrow. Now the next day, I come in. I try to thoroughly explain the issue to him. Like, I go hard on, all out, 
explaining, look, it's executing the commands. I know what the server is doing. He just tells me, oh, yeah, it's probably because of the Linux server. That's not why. It's because of the badly made web app. He says, hey, just send an email to the help desk. So I'm kind of dejected at this point, but I'm like, OK. So I send them the email with a nice subject header, vulnerability report. So I send a really good email, extreme documentation on it. I got an awesome description and some examples of exploits that are just showing, like, find out who is logged into the shell, what groups they're in, where the shell is. And then the last one was that little fork bomb that a lot of people are familiar with. I put over that one, don't do this, it's a fork bomb. And the server didn't crash, so I think they followed my advice. And so the ticket got escalated pretty quickly because it wasn't really help desk material. I made it at 9.52 a.m. when I sent the email got escalated from help desk to general IT about an hour later. And then it got escalated to the web team five minutes later. And someone without numbers in their Penn State ID commented on it at like 304. And the reason no numbers is probably important is because students typically have like four numbers after their name. So AZT70 is me. I'm a rare exception where I only have two numbers for some reason. So the first comment was, thanks for the report. We have programmers responsible for the site looking at it now. And at 526, there was another comment, thank you again for your report. The programmers informed me they fixed it, blah, 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 blah. And they said at the end, let me know if you have any further questions. Now I have a question. I ask, do they have a bug bounty pro do they have a bug bounty program? They said no, and they actually discouraged this, but we're thankful for your report. You helped make it a better place. Which I sort of interpreted like this. Where they just told me, get out. So we've learned a few more lessons. So that Penn State does not have a bug bounty program. They do not encourage bug hunting and don't get caught. And also, I suppose, if you don't have a bug bounty program, try to be nicer when you say, go away. But still get the point across. So that finishes up the wonderful story of what we learned from incident whatever. We're going to move on to QR codes. So uh, raise your hand if you have your smartphone with you. Raise your hand, or get your smartphone out now. Raise your smartphone. Ready? Open your barcode scanning app to scan this QR code. So QR codes, they're cool. You can scan this one, and it has a nice message for anyone who can do it. And it's just to demonstrate, QR codes are just a, a two-dimensional barcode that you can encode anything in. You can encode just the text. You did it, which is what this one contains. You could have a URL, which is what is most commonplace. And you could also just actually encode an entire image in a QR code. So if you want to be a real meanie face, you can actually encode a whole QR code inside of another QR code. And then they'll have to get their friend to scan that one. Don't do it. And so bulletin board flyers. Raise your hand if you would trust a QR code on a random bulletin board around campus. You scan it, and you think, you know what? That's OK. Anyone? Anyone? <sighs> Nobody raised their hands. We have a room of smart people. That's right. They're not very trustworthy. Now, is this scary to you? I think the answer is now yes. Because what if someone's a ninja? They could steal a flyer and replace it. They could put up a modified flyer. It's not really a difficult task to go up to a bulletin board, snatch a poster when no one's looking, take it home, put a different thing on it, put it back up when no one's looking. It's not a difficult task. There's a few implications to that, where if there's a flyer with a QR code that has a link to something, you can choose what URL people visit. So you can do some fun things like Rickroll them. You can spread propaganda, or you can do some nasty shenanigans with URL redirection. So we have to be afraid, because they could execute JavaScript and then redirect the browser, such as this nice example. Do bad things, window.location equals example.com. Obviously, I'm not actually doing bad things. There's bad things you can do with JavaScript, but that's really outside the scope of this talk and my expertise, because I'm not a fan of JavaScript. Is it hard to do this? It's not. You can scan it. You can save it as an image. You generate a new QR code. You can edit it using GIMP. This is really a trivial task. And, but that's a lot of tedious work. So if I'm going to do this, I want to automate it. So I'm going to automate it in Python. So I need to generate QR codes. There's a module called QR code. And for image processing, I said, hey, I'm going to use Pillow. 
So begins the dream of QR replacer, or a generated QR code. I place it over QR codes in an existing image, and I go to a hackathon and tell people, and I get two people to help me. So can three undergraduate students with no experience in image processing do it in under 36 hours? The answer is almost. We made some mistakes. We could locate a QR code in a low noise image, and we can insert a QR, a new image anywhere we want, such as where the old QR code was detected. So we can do most of it, although we don't do it that well. And a poorly coordinated team resulted in many, many merge conflicts and some really bad code architecture. This is an example of our commit history. We see some issues. So lessons learned. Merge conflicts can be a huge pain when you have three people who don't really know what they're doing. Image processing is pretty difficult when you don't know what you're doing. But a more dedicated and experienced individual, they could do this easily in under two weeks or so. So it is something that we might need to watch out for. I wanted to do a field test, but just doing that and not telling anyone felt really sketchy. I didn't want to do it. I felt like I was breaking some rule. So security research, going to do it right. I'm going to call it research so that I don't get in trouble. And there's stuff with ethics and research that really matters. Because lying to people, deceiving them, it's usually not very ethical. And we also want to see if the same person scans many QR codes to know, hey, is it a lot of people scanning these or is it just a few gullible people? And I need to get IRB certification for an experiment that I hope to someday run, which is a thing for doing ethical research involving people which this involves, of course. So to do that experiment, I created something called Redirect Log Queue, which is a nice name. It's just a piece of software. It's a server, and it will redirect the user and log the following things. The date and time of the redirect. The redirection token, which is every single time we want to create a URL redirection token, we say, hey, here's the token. Or no, here's the URL. It generates a UUID4 and converts it to base 62, which is just everything A to Z, caps and lowercase, along with the numbers, which is a lot easier to look at for URLs. And then a cookie, which we just generate a UUID and then give that to the person so we know, hey, let's see, have you visited our site multiple times? And we built it on Python using Flask and Mongo database. This time, we did it right. First, my team and I, we just made some skeleton code, we made sure we know what every single function does, and we have the program well designed. We know that everyone knows what to write, so we don't have as many merge conflicts. And it worked. It was amazing. And apparently I'm out of slides, so who has questions for this kind of short talk? Feel sorry for him. Anyone have questions uh, for the experiment? Uh, I have not conducted it yet. I want to get like IRB ethical research stuff so that I actually don't get in trouble for lying to people and maybe kind of tracking users because I could definitely see why someone would be mad if they found out someone was just doing that without telling anyone. So I want to make sure I don't get in trouble for it. The cover your butt lesson learned from incident whatever, I guess you could call it. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, I'm a freshman actually right now. Yeah. I have some time, yeah. Uh, no, although that's something I definitely probably will try to do in the future, maybe this summer when I have a little more free time. Any more questions? Awesome. Thank you.